Hey everyone, welcome back to Higher Biology. Today we are continuing with Unit 3 and we're moving on to Kira 4, which is animal welfare. So we've taken a little bit of a look at how we grow uh, crops, how we can protect the crops. Uh, today we're going to move on to livestock and how we can best uh, look after and give a good experience to animals that we grow for food. So we've mentioned this before in terms of sustainability, but if we were to look at intensive farming versus what we call free range farming, you can see a lot of differences, both in terms of uh, welfare, in terms of resources, and also in terms of cost. So for example, with chickens, we can see on the picture on the left-hand side here, we have a very intensive uh, chicken farm. You can see there's loads of chickens crammed together, uh, pretty much as far as I can see. There's automatic feeders that uh, go alongside uh, this room here and there's a huge amount of chickens being uh, being produced for food. So this is often more cost effective because everything's in bulk, the costs are low, um, but there's going to be perhaps sometimes some controversial conditions. You can have conditions of poor animal welfare, which means that they're probably not having the life uh, that they perhaps deserve or that's good for them. So it's cost effective, but it comes at the cost of poor animal welfare is your main takeaway for intensive farming. However, in free range, if we just uh, compare it to the picture on the right hand side, uh, we can see some happier looking chickens. There's lots of space, they're outside, uh, plenty of places to go and um, scrape up the land or go around and eat some food. This idea of free range, um, can be more expensive in terms of land, in terms of resources, and also work. It can be more labour intensive. But what's going to happen is that these animals are going to have a better quality of life, so they're going to have uh, higher levels of animal welfare. And because of that, you can also sell them for more. So this is one of the things we look at through this key area, is that uh, you can have this knock-on impact of price to the consumer. So in terms of this cost and benefit, uh, there is an initial cost to a farmer to increase animal welfare. So it can cost you more to provide the animals with higher levels of animal welfare. However, in the long term, there's a lot of benefits to this. So if you have like this extremely happy cow here on the right, uh, unstressed animals will grow better. They will often breed more successfully and they're also going to generate higher quality of products. So whether that is uh, milk from dairy cows or eggs from chickens or meat from various livestock, you're going to have a better quality of produce from animals that have a higher level of animal welfare. Uh, in terms of what we do in the UK, the standards of animal welfare in Britain are actually fairly high. Uh, so we've chosen to prioritise quite a lot on the welfare of the livestock that we produce. Because of that, there is an added cost to the consumer, like we've talked about before. If you produce a uh, uh, higher quality of animal welfare, then you can sell this for more. There's going to be more initial cost to you to set this up. However, what that then means is that some imported products from uh, countries that perhaps have lower standards of animal welfare, uh, they can be sold at a cheaper rate because it's more cost effective for them. So that means that, that uh, cost then isn't really getting passed on to the consumer, to the buyer. So you can buy the meat, for example, or eggs for a lower price, but it's probably came at the cost of lower standards of animal welfare. So part of the thing here is just a bit of a debate in terms of the ethics uh, when we look at things such as intensive farming. So is it actually right for us to exploit animals through this uh, more cost-effective, intensive way in order to just have cheaper animal products? So for example, you have some uh, chickens like we saw in the first slides that are crammed together for a long time. Uh, sometimes they can have their beaks trimmed, as you can see in the picture there, to stop them pecking and harming each other, which is natural if they're in a very close confinement and they get stressed. You also have, like we mentioned with sustainability, you can have cows that are kept inside their whole lives um, and they're just sort of pumped fed with uh, antibiotics. So you get the milk from them, they're not going to get ill. Uh, but again, it's not really a natural process, and it's probably a stressful environment for the cows. Other things as well, such as uh, pigs, a common one that comes up is that pigs have their tails docked uh, to stop each other when they're 
in uh, confined pens biting each other, th these sort of things. So there's an ethical issue for you to debate um, and in the classroom this is maybe something you can, you can talk about. In terms of uh, the sort of animal uh, rights, animal welfare though, uh, one of the laws that was passed in the UK was the Animal Welfare Act of 2006 which went and set out these five freedoms for animal welfare. So as I said, in the UK, we've put a bit more of a priority um, on to ensuring higher levels of animal welfare. So we set out these five freedoms and they're fairly straightforward and fairly understandable. The first one is that animals should have a freedom from thirst or hunger. So they shouldn't be hungry, they shouldn't be thirsty. They should have freedom from discomfort from pain, injury and disease, so they shouldn't be kept in conditions where they are either in pain or uncomfortable. Um, the freedom to express normal behaviour is something we'll discuss a little bit here as well. Um, sometimes it's to do with uh, physical freedom as well, if some animals need to roam about a little bit and not just be kept in confined pens. And the other one as well, understandable, freedom from fear and distress. That's also a fairly important thing for animals uh, to have. So what we're going to look at for the rest of this key area, um, it is pretty short. The main takeaway I want you to have from this key area is behavioural indicators of poor welfare. So essentially there are uh, four different indicators here. So indicators in terms of an animal's behaviour, which shows they are maybe being subject to poor levels of animal welfare. The first one is stereotypy. There is misdirected behaviour. Uh, failure in sexual or parental behaviour and then also altered levels of activity. So you need to know all four of these and know what they actually mean. We'll go through each one just um, step by step here. So for example, stereotypy is uh, basically a repetitive behaviour pattern. So if you have an animal that is repeatedly chewing on a cage or a bar or they're continually uh, pacing back and forth, shaking their head or rocking from side to side. It's the sort of thing you can often see in um, adverts about animal welfare on TV when you have um, ex-circus animals or things like this that have been treated poorly and they often exhibit, uh, sorry, exhibit stereotypy where they're repeatedly shaking back and forth, for example. So any form of repetitive motion is stereotypy. Okay, and that would be an indicator of uh, poor levels of animal welfare. The second one, misdirected behaviour. Uh, this is where an animal would either uh, direct its attention inappropriately, so in a negative way, probably a harmful way, to either itself or another animal or surroundings. So a good example of this is chickens. If they're getting really stressed, if they're in confined areas, um, they can start plucking their own feathers out or they can start attacking other chickens. Um, if they were to, to keep doing this and really harming themselves, then this would be an example of misdirected behaviour. It is not normal for them to, to do this to such an extent. Again, a behavioural indicator of poor welfare. Um, second of all, in terms of more intensive farming um, to do with mullers and offspring, you can have a situation where there is a failure in either sexual or parental behaviour. So the idea being for the sexual behaviour is that in uh, areas of poor welfare or situations of poor animal welfare, you may have animals uh, that are isolated, the, you know, these poor conditions that they're in, they may fail to actually breed successfully. There may be a failure in that sexual behaviour in the first place. The second part though in terms of parental behaviour uh, often occurs when young are removed from their mother too early. So for example, if this calf was taken away from its mother um, at an extremely young age, it's not developed that bond, it's maybe not learned enough from its mother. Uh, and then what can happen is if that calf was to grow up and have its own offspring, is it actually would not know how to bring up their own offspring. So it could reject the calf or it may not know how to appropriately clean it or show it uh, various forms of behaviour or learning because that opportunity has been removed from them through this poor animal welfare and that leads to this failure in parental behaviour. And then finally the last one is fairly self-explanatory but it is altered levels of activity. And there's two forms of this. There should be a normal range of activity shown by livestock. However, if you have an animal that can be uh, showing hyper-aggression, that's running about the place, snapping at other animals, 
that can be a form of hysteria. Hysteria, so moving around really fast, really aggressive, um, that is above the level of activity you expect. However, in the opposite spectrum, you can have apathy, which would just be excessive sleeping, lying around, not really doing anything. That is again an altered level of activity, and again, that would be an indicator of poor welfare in that area. So finally, we've looked at those four different indicators or behavioural indicators of poor welfare. We're going to finish off on a maybe a more positive note, talking about how you can reduce these behaviours. Okay, so if you had animals in this situation, you don't want them to be in this situation, how can you improve it? So there are four different ways we can uh, improve animal welfare uh, in these situations. The first is socialisation, uh, particularly socialisation with their own kind and from a young age. Animals on the whole are social creatures and they need to go and have this social contact with their own kind. Um, they can go around, some animals have uh, have been found to actually have friends they stick around with, for example. So you need them to be able to socialise. They shouldn't be stuck on their own, isolated in a cage, for example. The rest of them really come across to having a bit of space, like when we looked at free range. You need to have space for natural exercise, for them to walk about, for them to, to run, any of the things like this to exhibit some um, natural behaviour, especially if their enclosure can in some way resemble their natural habitat. It's more natural for them, it's going to be less stressful for them than if you're just in this large indoor uh, caged environment. And finally, it can be really good to give them these sort of enriched tasks, so basically to, to keep them busy, to keep their mind active. If you were to go and uh, allow them to forage for food in this enclosure, this space that you're growing the livestock in or bringing up the livestock, then that is also something that would reduce uh, these indicators because it would be improving their animal welfare. So that's it for this key area. Okay, key area four, again, it's fairly short. Um, the main thing you need to be aware of is the costs and benefits of animal welfare. So for example, you can uh, it can cost you a little bit more in the short term to improve animal welfare, but it's a better thing for the animal. You can also sell it for a lot, uh, higher price and you have higher quality products. Um, if you have animals in poor levels of welfare, it's more cost effective. That's the, the balance and you can discuss the ethics of both of those. As I said, the main thing I want you to take from this is the behavioural indicators of poor welfare. So remember, have a look at stereotypy, the repetitive behaviour, misdirected behaviour in terms of uh, harming yourself or others, that failure in sexual or parental behaviour and also look at the apathy and hysteria, the two forms of altered levels of activity. Uh, apart from that, hopefully you found this useful. Thanks, as always, for the comments, everyone. Uh, we're getting towards the end of Hire Now, so I'll get the rest of the videos up. Thanks so much for listening, and speak to you soon.